All right, y'all, welcome back to Common Arms Channel. So today's video, we're checking out the New Zealand Special Air Service. Now, we've checked out the Australian Special Air Service Regiment, and I wanted to make sure I, I checked them out first because I was getting both of these recommendations a lot, so I'd say, over the past five months. So now that we did the Australian SASR about a month ago, we have room to check out these guys, which I definitely wanted to do because you can imagine any unit that has the same sort of namesake as the original British SAS are probably gonna be pretty badass. So yeah, I definitely want to check them out and see what sort of training they go through. But this video is called Inside the SAS Creating the Elite Soldier. So it might give us a little bit of background for their history and maybe even their selection process and what they actually need to do to join. So yeah, very excited to check them out. Again, any sort of SAS unit, they gotta be pretty badass. But yeah, if you guys couldn't tell, I have some uh, decorations in the background. So, yeah, I think it's a I think it's pretty festive. If you have arachnophobia, then I apologize, but yeah, I mean, I got the jack-o-lantern in there too, so it's pretty cool. So hopefully you guys can appreciate that as we're uh, approaching Halloween. I'm not really sure if you guys do Halloween anywhere else. Do you guys do Halloween in the United Kingdom or Finland or Sweden or anything or in the Philippines? Cuz yeah, I have no idea. It's a very American thing, especially with the candy, but yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's pretty cool. I like to put up decorations, so I'm gonna try and continue to put up decorations, just depending on what kind of, what, what time of the year it is. So, hopefully, you guys can appreciate that. But let us get into the video. Now, the audio in this video is a little weird. It seems because there's not really any background music, but it seems special operation forces badass. of which the New Zealand SAS is is a component of provide government with options to deploy in any number of contexts and mission types that are beyond the normal capabilities of a conventional force. Yep. Okay, some explosive breaching. All right, let's stop right here. Okay, so of course we have to check out the gear. That's, uh, that's nothing new. Now, I see the flight suits and I'm very excited to see the flight suits because one, they look badass regardless of you know whatever unit is using them. Um, I used to use flight suits on my CQB team, and honestly, they're, they're just super comfortable. They're just like, they're like a giant onesie, almost like pajamas that you just throw on, you zip up. So you have awesome range of motion. Uh, it's pretty breathable. It's generally not too hot, and yeah, it's just, it's generally used because they're made of like Nomex. They're like, they're flame retardant. So uh, if you're using flashbangs, it's an awesome option. Now we can also see they have a bunch of chem lights. Um, so those are, those are generally used for marking um, danger areas. So if there's like an IED or something that just seems sketchy, they can use it to mark. Or generally, they're just using it to mark when a room was cleared. So they know they don't need to go and re-clear that room. Now you can see right here, he's also got flashbangs on his back. See if we can zoom in a little bit. So right here, he's got flashbangs on his back, and that's because whenever they're in the stack, um, you know, he doesn't need to be messing with his own flashbangs. The person behind him can be utilizing his flashbangs off of his back, and that works out pretty well. We did practice this a little bit on my CQB team, and uh, yeah, it's a pretty good concept, and it just allows you to free up like all the other space on your kit. So if you have like a belt or like a plate carrier, you don't need to put your flashbangs easily accessible. You can just throw them on your back and you know, you're always gonna generally be in a stack or you're gonna be near someone. So if you wanna utilize a flashbang, you can do that. And you can leave all this uh, real estate for like more important stuff like magazines or communication setup. So that's a really awesome thing to see. We can see they have medical equipment, like a tourniquet and uh, yeah, some awesome holsters. So. Of course, we need to check out the kit because you can see it's very focused on that CQB environment. Yeah, that looks like a lot of fun. That's some solid training right there. The guys and girls that, that serve, they all volunteer. So it tells me that they actually want to be here to do well, to represent their country, uh, to serve. For me, it was a, a long-burning desire. So I'm Makes sense. quite proud to be here right now. Yeah, you definitely want people who really want to be in that unit. Trying the to... SAS is not just New Zealand Army. There's members from the Navy and Air Force, as well as a direct entry pathway too. So civilians that have the desire to serve hmm. have the uh, the opportunity to do that. Okay. There's guys from all... All 
All right. Yeah, so they were saying, they're saying you can have civilians actually join. So that's kind of interesting. I wonder if the civilians have to go through like some basic military training or if they just go straight to the selection. Cause that'd be kind of weird having people who have no idea what the military is like joining something like this. Cause generally you want someone who's a little bit more mature, who has a pretty solid understanding of just basic military fundamentals. But at the same time, if you get some like really badass dudes who are just, you know, super beefed up and intelligent and mature, maybe they can be a good fit for the unit. But yeah, I'm not sure how that works out. So if you guys could provide some insight, definitely throw that in the comment section. Walked, you know, you get the rugby player. You had farmer's sons. You've got the <laughs> boxer. You had the guy that used to run with the gangs but never got into trouble with it. Or the guy that was a lawyer. It's a wide cross-section of people huh. in the community. Yeah, that's interesting. Again, you do want that wide variety because it, it helps the unit out for sure. Hmm. I wonder where this memorial is located. Okay. Okay, right, so it's this again. <laughs> okay, I like that shuffle he did. Without getting into specifics about operations, uh, it would okay. be fair to say that we have uh, a 70 odd year history. Uh, those lessons that we've learned over time have never been forgotten. They provide us with the baseline, the, the, the building blocks for us to continue to improve on. Right. So about 70 years, that's about 1950s, 1940s. So yeah, that's, that's pretty old. I'm not really sure if these guys were made out of necessity based off of some conflict that was going on, but I'm not really sure what New Zealand, uh, I'm not really sure what, what you know, role they took in like World War II or Korean War or anything after that, or so if they had any additional conflicts that I'm not aware of. So if you guys could provide a little bit of history or context for why these guys might have been formed, then definitely put that in the comment section because I don't really know that much about New Zealand. Um, I just basically know where they're located geographically and uh, yeah, sort of like what their culture is like. But yeah, that'd be cool to know, especially when you're talking about the military. Um, they're sort of saying that, you know, they, they had lessons learned over time and they were able to adapt over that. But yeah, a country's conflicts and their history will definitely shape their military. Pretty much all of the training is based on real operational experience, some of which have been learnt the hard way. Mm. Things aren't done for, for no reason, they're done for a reason because something happened. Yeah. That's the a nice level that shoot we, house. Uh, that they put us through is more designed to allow us to think uh, when um, the pressure is on and then to come up with an option um, to obviously um, move through that situation. Wow, okay, their kit setup is awesome. They have like really solid pouches. Um, you can see he's also got Nomex flight gloves. So again, Nomex is just one of those things, if you're working with flashbangs, it's nice to have a lot of flame retardant materials. And uh, those Nomex flight gloves, they're not really that durable, that, but they do provide a pretty solid range of motion. And you don't really need a whole lot of like really thick material on your gloves if you're doing CQB so much, because that's normally for like a little bit of rougher terrain and everything. So yeah, their kit looks really, really solid. It's really cool to check out. But again, again, the shoot house just looks incredible. Of course, when you're talking about the special air servers, they should be getting the uh, the state of the art equipment and facilities to train with. When you look at uh, accidents uh, within the sort of the training regime, I think you need to understand and appreciate just what they do. Now, what we're talking about here is big boys rules. As a former all-black uh, all captain once said, we're not here playing tiddlywinks. So in order to reach that standard, SAS and the Special Operations Forces apply training techniques um, which will have an element of risk about them. So For we're sure. talking about uh, operating with live rounds, parachute, uh, swimming, rock climbing, climbing buildings, jumping out of aircraft, Right. So what he's saying is really important. And a lot of people, especially civilians, can't really appreciate it that much. 
because you know there there are a bunch of training accidents all over the place and they happen all the time and you'll see it's it's mainly with units who have a dangerous mission whether it be infantry or combat arms or special forces they need to do this this realistic difficult training and dangerous training because that's what their job entails they need to be comfortable doing the dangerous stuff because it really tests each other and allows allows the unit to see what weaknesses are so if someone's not comfortable with this they can train a little bit more and uh, yeah you get to sort of see what everyone's strengths and weaknesses are and again it just allows everyone to sort of you know, strengthen all those weaknesses that they have, or at least get comfortable with what they're doing. Like me personally, I have a huge fear of heights, or I used to have a, a much bigger fear of heights, but as I started doing repelling and all this stuff, I sort of got used to it, but you need to do that dangerous, stressful training to get used to it. Of course, some people are going to be totally fine with jumping out of airplanes or repelling out of helicopters, and they're not gonna be, you know, freaked out about the heights, but yeah, you definitely wanna make sure you do that sort of stress inoculation just to make sure everybody knows how to deal with it and and how they respond to the training nice rifle yeah awesome facility looks like a lot of fun this is my little home away from home my man cave if you like i just come in here occasionally now and i've just got all the stuff that I've collected over the years of my service. It's 20 years and I, I filled up this whole nice. garage and I call it my bunker. You know, we've got things <laughs> like the old towels we used to use in those yep. days in the jungle, wrapped right around your neck, you know. Um, oh, I've seen a lot of selections and taken a lot of selections. I've seen guys, you know, staggering and falling over and basically pretty much <laughs> crawling across that last piece. I've seen heartbreaking guys, guys breaking down in tears. For simple terms, they haven't got the right stuff. But that's not their fault. <laughs> it's just their makeup. Yeah. Nice. Some people like have that. it, some people don't. Total focus. Uh, if you haven't got that, you're not there. Yeah. One of the richest set sure. of conversations that we ask at the beginning of an essay selection cycle is, why do you want to be here? What is your motivation to be here? One of the most commonly reported motivation to join, to join the unit is something along the lines of being useful or being, um, being able to contribute. They perceive that the unit will be something that can help challenge them in a meaningful way. Uh, it will be an environment where they can fulfill the mm. desire to contribute to others, to New Zealand, to the world, as well as... Yeah, so you definitely, I kind of cut her off there, but what she said was really important. Like you, you want people and you're going to see people who really want to challenge themselves going into uh, selections or units like this because, uh, you know, with the volunteer military, you know, people generally want to be doing what they're doing. Like, especially now for me in the U.S. Army infantry and being Marine infantry, you have volunteers. So you have people who generally understand what the job's going to be like and they joined it for a reason, whether it be to make a purpose or just do something badass or get the benefits, they join that job for a reason and they, and they know exactly what they're getting into generally. So they need to have that understanding. And when you're talking about special operations, you want people who are going to challenge themselves even more. So people who go to these selections are people who, you know, they, they've done everything that they wanted to do in their previous unit and now they want to challenge themselves because they want to do something more than what they were doing previously and that's generally what you'll be seeing with with people who go to these selections and it makes a lot of sense and I can appreciate that mindset of wanting to do more because there's always more you can do and especially when you have try hard people you know they're just going to want to do as much as possible and I can appreciate that mindset that's an awesome mindset there's a place where they can develop their capabilities the mental attitude comes through our our ethos and values there's reminders every day of how we pursue excellence around our organisation, that uh, we don't have to be uh, aptly trained uh, technically, but the vision of pursuing excellence is pretty much how we drive hmm. uh, the level of our training. It's a good point. So nice. we are a operationally ready organisation that on request of the government can deploy at short notices on a variety of operations. Yeah. Nice range. 
do, do we know everything that the SAS does or has done in, in the past? There probably is a little bit more that goes on. They're relatively sort of quiet when it comes to talking <laughs> about what they do. Uh, and they leave that to the politicians to talk about. <laughs> I like how you threw that in there. But yeah, for sure, especially when you're talking about special operations and the SAS in general are going to be like your top tier special operations. Yeah, they're generally going to be doing stuff that they can't really talk about too much. But at the same time, people who sort of join this this occupation or these units are people that don't really want to talk about what they're doing because they have a certain respect for their job and they have a sort of respect for you know, what they do and what their buddies do and, and how hard it is. And they don't want to be voicing this all the time to, to all these different people just so they can sort of inflate their ego. Because you can, you can imagine the people who join units like this don't really have that ego. They do it for like selfless service. They do it for a reason that's bigger than themselves. So they're not really all about that publicity most of the time. These guys are here because they want to, they want to test themselves. They want to be part of of this rather unique and special organisation and they want to be able to test those skills at some stage. Mm. They are very aware of these standards and the importance of maintaining those standards at all times. For sure. <laughs> that looks like a lot of fun, dude. That range especially looks so clean and so fun. Hopefully it has some pretty good ventilation so they're not getting like lead poisoning. But yeah, that looks like a lot of fun. And I'm glad these guys have some, some solid facilities because you can imagine they're definitely the people that deserve it the most when you're talking about the, the special air service. So very cool, very awesome recommendation. I couldn't find too many videos about the New Zealand SAS. But if there are any videos out there that sort of go over any of their operations, definitely feel free to throw them in the comment section if you guys can find any of those because it'd be... It'd be cool to see what these guys have, have done previously, at least things that have been brought to the public's eye. But yeah, very, very cool. Again, when you're talking about the SAS, you can imagine the unit's going to be badass. But yeah, it was just, it was awesome checking out their gear. Their gear was very akin to what I was using previously on my CQB team, and it makes a lot of sense. You can imagine they're pretty professional, and their kit's going to be designed for what they need, and not really anything too crazy. But yeah. A lot of fun to check out. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think in the comment section regardless. If you know anything about the New Zealand SAS, any other operations, if you worked with them, feel free to throw that in the comment section because, yeah, these guys are awesome. I'd like to know a little bit more about their sort of lineage and their history. But, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Very cool to check out. But that is it for this one. So we'll see you all in the next one.